We've been looking at Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. We started looking in, uh, I think it was the book of Mark. It talks about Jesus. He turned toward Jerusalem, and he immediately had a guy come up to him and ask him how he could get eternal life. Uh, and we come to find out this man was a very wealthy man, and this man wanted to have the best that this world had to offer as well as the best the next world had to offer. The man wanted to follow Jesus but without having to sacrifice anything. And Jesus knew that about the man and knew his heart and told the man, no, you need to sacrifice some stuff if you're going to follow me. The stuff that you are putting above your, your, your dedication and loyalty to the Lord, you're going to need to sacrifice that stuff. And it says the man went away sad because he did not want to sacrifice anything in order to follow Jesus. And then last week we saw as Jesus continued on the road to Jerusalem, uh, Jared was preaching and he talked about Jesus had 10 lepers come running up to him. And Jared gave us a great picture of what first century leprosy looked like and the culture that surrounded that and the fear that surrounded that. And uh, uh, Jesus healed these guys and nine of them ran off, but one of them came back to Jesus and uh, thanked him with, with effusive gratitude. Well, today we're going to look uh, in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 10. Uh, it's on page 846. If you're going to use one of the pew Bibles there in front of you. And if you don't have a Bible, if you do not have a physical Bible, take that Bible home with you. That can, that can be your free gift. You don't have to take it home. It's not a borrow type of deal. It's yours, okay? Nobody's going to stop you at the door if they see you walking out with one of the sanctuary Bibles. It's fine. It's your Bible you can take home. Write your name in it right now with one of those little golf pencils you see in front of you. You can take that Bible home and, and use that one. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, uh, page 846. We're going to start down in verse 32. Mark writes, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. So they're walking on the road, and some people are afraid, and some people are in awe. Some people are in awe and then afraid because of the awe they have for Jesus, uh, because of the things he's been teaching, as well as the miracles that he's been doing, and that he's right there in front of them. It just is overwhelming to them. And so in the midst of this atmosphere, as they go from town to town towards Jerusalem, they're gathering a bigger and bigger following as they're going, this massive parade making its way towards Jerusalem. And in among all these people, Jesus pulls his 12 disciples together. And this is what he says, verse 33, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn, condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. He will rise. That word literally means he will be made alive again uh, in the original language. And so Jesus is giving them a preview of what's to come. He's telling him all this stuff's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be killed. But don't worry because I'm going to be made alive again. And so he's giving them a preview of what's coming down the road. But again, the disciples are going to forget all of this in the midst of the crucifixion and the arrest and all that stuff to come. And, and they're, they're not going to remember this until later on. But Jesus is telling them, get ready for what's coming, because it's about to be difficult. It's about to be hard. And so this is the gospel, right? This is a very serious moment. He's telling them about the salvation of the world him dying and him raising from the dead. And this is where their thoughts go. Verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, I find that verse very comical um, for several reasons. Uh, actually, in, in Matthew's telling of this situation. It wasn't just James and John. They brought their mom with them. They brought their mom to Jesus to ask him, just give us whatever we want. They're asking for a blank check from the Son of God. And they want him to say yes before they issue his request or, or you know, his 
uh, before they say what they wanted. Have you ever had, if you have children, have you ever had your child come to you and ask you to give them something but not exactly say what they want you to give them kind of a situation? James and John, part of Jesus' inner circle, and even in addition to that, we find out at the crucifixion, the mother of James and John is the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary. So they're Jesus' cousins. And they're coming to Jesus, maybe they think because of their relation they've got an in, or maybe they think because they're in the 12 they've got an in, or maybe they think they're, they're Peter, James, and John, they're one of the three, they've got an in. And they say, okay, Jesus, just will you give us whatever we ask? They're thinking they can do that. And they brought their mom because they think that, you know, their mom will support them in this, you know, uh, Jesus, you should give them whatever they want. You know, they, they've served you all this time, they've done all this. And so they come and they make this Crazy request. Give us whatever we want. Verse 36. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? So he answers their question with a question. He says, okay, you want me to give you whatever you want. Let's define that a little bit before I tell you whether or not I'm going to do it. And so here's their request. So remember, Jesus has just told them, we're going to Jerusalem I'm going to die and raise from the dead for the salvation of the world. Verse 37. And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So the, their request is for personal honor, for personal recognition. And it would seem as though they, they sort of understood what Jesus was talking about in saying that he's going to die and raise from the dead. They sort of understand that the end is coming, the end of their, mis their mission, their, their journey together, because they're already thinking about the end. They're thinking about Jesus being in his glory. And he says, okay, when the end comes and you get to heaven, ha can we sit beside you in front of everybody in heaven as they worship you? We want to be right next to you. Right there. So when, you know, in today's modern terms, it's like you go to, uh, you know, you're at a friend's birthday party and everybody's taking a picture of your, their, of your friend. And if you're standing on either side of your friend, you're in everybody's picture. And so James and John are thinking, everybody's going to be looking at Jesus and they're going to see us because we're right there next to him in the places of honor. The right-hand seat is the most honorable. The left-hand seat is the second most, more honorable than any other place in heaven. Jesus, can we just sit right next to you? And they're thinking, Jesus, we're in the 12. Jesus, we're your cousins. Jesus, we're in the top three of the disciples. Can we just sit by you in what's coming? Can we just go ahead and, 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 and you know, assign those seats right now? You know, we, we can't call shotgun because we can't see them yet. But go ahead and just assign the seats now. Put our name tags on them so that when we get there, there's already reserved signs. And so, you know, when Peter and Thaddeus and... Bartholomew get all to heaven, they're going to see, oh, those are James and John's seats, and they don't get them yet. And so they make this request of Jesus. Now, if you're Jesus, obviously none of you are, so I don't want to spoil that for you, but if you're Jesus in that moment, what are you thinking? Spoiled little punks. Are you kidding me? You want, I just said I'm going to save the world by dying and raising from the dead, and you want to sign seats in heaven. Are you kidding me right now? This is not the time or the place to make this request. And so they, this is just, you know, what's even crazier about this is there have been two other places in Scripture where they have been caught by Jesus talking about this very thing, talking about which one of them is the better disciple, which one of them is the most honorable disciple. There was another time in Mark chapter 9, they were discussing which one of them is greater and which one of them deserves the most honor by Jesus. And Jesus caught him and said, that's not the most important thing, guys. And again, on the night of the Last Supper, right, hours from Jesus being arrested and taken and crucified, they have just finished the Lord's Supper. Jesus had just done communion. He's just finished. They've prayed. And then a little conversation breaks out at the table as they finish communion about which one of the disciples is the best. Well, I'm sitting next to Jesus. I got a little more of the communion bread than you did. I drank a little more of the drink than you did. And they're talking in the room of the Last Supper about which one's the greatest. And Jesus caught them. They're doing that, saying, guys, this is not the issue right now. So this was a common thread. And this is only a first century thing, right? We don't care about recognition anymore, right? We don't care about getting the honor that we think we're due anymore. That was just something they dealt with back then, right? We don't, nobody deals with that anymore, right? Some of you elbowed the person next to you. 
<laughs> you can be in the doghouse later. And so there, Jesus turns to these guys. Verse 38, look at this. He says to them, you do not know what you are asking. You're asking for something beyond your comprehension. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which that I am baptized? He's saying those places are for people who are going to endure quite a bit. Are you ready to deal with everything that's coming? Verse 39. And they said to him, we are able. So they answered before really knowing what they're going to go through. Remember, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. He hadn't been beaten yet. He hadn't been spit on yet. He hadn't been mocked yet. And they answered before they knew any of that. Yes, absolutely, we're ready. And Jesus tells them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus tells them, you're going to go through everything I'm going to go through. But to be on my right and my left has already been set. You're asking too late. This request, is, this, this request has already been answered. Those spots are already reserved. Remember, their question was, when you come in your glory, can we be at your right and your left? Can we be at your right and your left? Now, <laughs> I was having a conversation with my wife last night about the message today, and, and, and she helped me see something. When you come in your glory, that was their question. Look back, all right? Uh, verse, where was it? There it is, verse 37. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. I want you to remember that phrase, in your glory. Now look down at Jesus' answer. He doesn't qualify his answer. To sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those, it is for, those for whom it has been prepared. Now, I want you to flip over just real quick. John chapter 13. Chapter 13. This is during the Last Supper. During the Last Supper. John chapter 13 down in verse 31. So remember, their question was, when you come in your glory, can we be at your right and your left? Okay? Verse 31. Judas has just left to go betray Jesus. Things have been set in motion now. Crucifixion is happening. And Jesus says... Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Jesus says, I am in my glory now, going to, cr going to die. This is the glory that for which I came. I am in my glory now. James and John asked to be on his right and his left in glory. Jesus is saying, now is the glory. And when Jesus was in his glory, dying on the cross, criminals were on his right and his left. Not James and John. Not Peter. Not Bartholomew, not Timothy, criminals, people that had already been assigned. And one of those guys who were next to him, one of those criminals, needed salvation. That's why he was there. Jesus is saying, you guys have no idea what's coming to ask that question. People are already going to be on my right and my left in my glory as I am revealed in death. For one of them needs to be in heaven today. They both do. One's not going to believe. The other one will. And so Jesus is telling them, it's already been set. Look at verse 41, uh, back in Luke, uh, Mark chapter 10. Verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant. They were mad. They were upset. They were angry. That James and John is asking this question. Remember, this is a common theme among the disciples. They have this issue consistently. Which one of them is the best? Which one of them is the greatest? Which one of them is the most honorable? Should be recognized by Jesus. And so the other ten are mad that James and John ask this question. Wouldn't you think they're probably more mad that James and John asked it first? Before they did? That James and John thought of it before they did? And they're thinking, I should have been up in there asking that question. I, should, I had a chance yesterday. Jesus and I were there by the fire cooking the fish. I should have asked it. And they're mad that James and John asked this question. 
mad at James and John, mad at themselves that this issue is there. And so in this atmosphere, James and John with the wrong spirit, the other ten disciples with the wrong spirit, mad at James and John, mad at themselves, all this anger, all this disunity, and then Jesus speaks into it. Verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. He says, guys, the people of this world want to be the best, want to be recognized as the best, want to be seen as achieving a certain level of honor. And he says, when it comes to eternity, that's not what it's about. Getting a leg up on everybody else, getting higher up on, on the scale than everybody else, getting more worldly honor and worldly recognition than anybody else. He says, that doesn't matter. That's not the issue at all. He says, it, it, we're measuring two different things. The world measures one thing is important. He says, I, God, measure something else is important. And you can't measure eternal greatness with a temporary standard. You can't measure eternal greatness with a temporary standard. Let me illustrate it for you. Hey, Jared, will you come help me out real quick? I didn't give Jared a heads up that I was going to do this. I, I had him get me this tape measure. This is a tape measure. It measures things. Oh, that wasn't working earlier this week when I was in the ceiling trying to get those cords and it wasn't snapping back. And now that's not working. That's, well, I'll take the tape measure. That's, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy now. That was good. I was really frustrated when that wasn't snapping. Sorry. I get easily entertained. Um, all right. So what does a tape measure do? It measures height, right? So Jared could take this tape measure, and he could measure how tall I am. I want you to take the tape measure, and I want you to measure how much I weigh. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? Or I could have a scale up here, and I could say, all right, measure how tall I am. And it doesn't work that way. They each value something different to determine what they're measuring. The tape measure, here, pull it out. The tape measure values certain increments, right? Inches or, uh, no, there's no metric on this. It's all inches, yeah. The it, it yeah, the way it should be. Uh, it measures inches. And you can't use inches to measure weight. In the same way, you can't use pounds to measure height. They value completely different things. Thank you. Good job. Good job, man. man. You fixed my tape measure. I'm going to give you a bonus or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's saying that's, on rec that's recording right now. You heard that. Um, they value completely different things. They measure different things. They value different things. Whereas in, in these verses, Jesus says, worldly greatness says, serve me because I'm great. Heavenly greatness says, I will serve you because he is great. It's not about my greatness because in and of me, I have no greatness. Anything good that comes out of me is all him. Anything bad that comes out of me is all me. Every single time. It's all him if it's great. It's all him if it's good, if it's wise, if it's, you know, if it's a sticky statement. Me as the preacher, anything good that comes out of my mouth is all Jesus. Anything dumb and ridiculous that doesn't make sense, that is all me, 100%. 100%. I got the degrees in my closet to prove it. It's all me, 100%. Jesus says, heavenly greatness is all about how great the Lord is. And then he gives this, this phenomenal statement here in this last verse, and how he illustrates this to the people. He says, verse 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Son of man, that's a title. That, that, that is a title of the Messiah, of the Son of God. He says, even me, the Son of God. John chapter 1 says the world was created by Jesus. He says, even me came to serve. Didn't come to demand everybody serve. But I came to serve, as he's going to demonstrate when he kneels down and he washes their feet. As he demonstrates when he willfully, willingly, intentionally goes to the cross and allows his creation to kill him. He says, I came to serve. If anyone in the world demands absolute loyalty and service, it would be Jesus. And Jesus said, I came to die. I came to die to save many. That word there, verse 45, look at it again. To give his life as a ransom, a ransom for many. That word means a substitutionary price paid to secure release. A substitutionary price paid to secure release. And so Jesus is saying, Personal greatness is not the goal of the Christian life. Personal honor is not the goal of the Christian life. Personal recognition is not the goal of the Christian life. Neither is personal authority. Neither is controlling a situation. Neither is a life without hardship. That is not the goal of the Christian life. Jesus, who by nature deserves all recognition, did not come seeking recognition. Came to serve, came to be a ransom for many. He did not come seeking it. He came to pay a ransom, a substitutionary price, to secure release. So what did he come exactly, specifically for, securing that release? Well, he tells us that. Flip over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Just a few pages there. Luke chapter 4, down in verse 16. Jesus walks into his hometown, Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It's, uh, Luke writes, He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah had been, was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty, freedom, to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, freedom, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And all the eyes of, uh, uh, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled. This prophecy from Isaiah chapter 61, this has been fulfilled today. I have been anointed to come for this reason. I have been anointed to come and bring freedom Jesus came as a ransom for many. And what was that definition? A substitutionary price paid to secure release. Jesus came to set people free. To set them free. Completely, absolutely free. Freedom from all kinds of things. Freedom from temptation. Freedom from expectations. Expectations that have been bogging you down from the past. Maybe your own, maybe ones ingrained in you from your parents or from other people that have been in your lives and they have certain expectations that they desire you to meet and you've been in bondage to those things for so long. Expect or, uh, freedom from having to control every situation. Jesus said, take my burden upon you for it is light. Take, release your own. Freedom. From bitterness, unforgiveness, freedom. 
from your past. Freedom from someone else's past that wounded you, damaged your heart, and you've been hanging on to it for decades. He came to secure that release with his substitutionary payment, his death. He came to bring freedom. He came to bring freedom from fear. Fear of what might happen. Fear of what could happen. Fear of, of, of how a situation will play out. Fear of what the doctor might say on that phone call that you're awaiting. Fear of, of what will fall in your job. Fear of somebody in your own house. Fear of somebody who's in your family. He came to bring freedom from it. Freedom from it. And the image is... Okay, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, you've been granted that freedom. But the image is, it comes from the book of Acts, when Paul and Silas were in that prison, all their bonds were off, all the doors of the prison were open. They were free, but they were still in prison. You see, you can be a follower of Jesus and have absolute freedom but be, still be sitting in the prison of unforgiveness. Still be sitting in the prison of fear. Still be sitting in the, in the prison of other people's opinions or other people's expectations. Or still be sitting in that prison that he has come to set you free from. And you may say, hey, preacher man, that's easy for you to say, but this thing has been weighing on my mind for, for years and I can't get rid of it. I've tried all this stuff. I've read all these books about how to get rid of this stuff in your mind and it won't leave. And I've, I've been to this person and this person and, and I can't just get it out and it won't leave. And it may not leave the way you want it to. Sometimes the wounds of our past have to scar over. They still hurt from time to time. But it doesn't mean they're not healed. Many years ago, uh, when my, a week before my oldest was born, I slipped in the garage and my hand hit the door jam as I was coming back in the house. And it broke my, this bone right here, my ring finger down in here. And it was a twisty break. And so I had to go and have surgery. Uh, I had surgery two days before he was born. And uh, they put screws in it. It doesn't hurt. But every once in a while, I'll bang one of those screws on something, Ugh. and I can feel it, and, and that's not a fun feeling at all, uh, and I can feel it shooting all the way up my finger, and, 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 and it's frustrating, and some of you just go, because mm, you know that feeling, and it's not good. It's scarred over. It's healed. They tell me with the screws in it, it's stronger than it was before, but sometimes it still hurts. When... We have been hurt by something Jesus came to set us free from. Sometimes it's still going to hurt. But that doesn't mean he didn't set you free from it. That just means you're still in this temporary world that has a broken system. There's going to come a day when there's no more pain. We're not there yet. Revelation chapter 20, 21, 22 talks about that day. We're not there yet. And so there's still going to be pain and difficulties. But if we lean on Jesus, every step we take gets a little bit easier. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But if you lean on Jesus, the freedom becomes more apparent, becomes more obvious. You have to allow him to bring you through the place, the darkness, the difficulty, the the. the Maybe the thing he came to set you free from is some kind of substance. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's, it's the reason you turn to drugs and alcohol. The person who was there in the past who led you there. And, and it's been something you've clung to. Clung on to. Maybe it's anger. Maybe you get set free from anger. Anger that was passed down to you from previous generation. And you don't want to pass it on to the next generation. The only way to cut it off at the knees is to lean into Jesus and allow him 
to pull it out of you. He came to bring freedom. To bring freedom. Are you free today? Are you free? And if you examine yourself and you say, I am not. I've got one of those things you mentioned, or I got one of those things that you didn't mention that's in the back of my mind, and I've been so anxious, you're going to say it, preacher, that you're going to say the thing that I've been struggling with, and the people who are sitting in my row are going to know it's all about me that you're talking to right now, and, and I just don't want you to say that thing that I've been struggling with that, that I need freedom from, and I do need freedom, but I haven't been set free yet. There's one of two reasons if you haven't found the freedom. One of two. The first one is you don't know Jesus. That's the first one. You don't know Jesus. You have to believe in him, that Jesus is God's son, that he died so all your sins would be forgiven, and he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. And if you believe that, you're saved for all time. Nothing can undo it. Nothing can, get a, can, can stop the salvation he already brought you. It's already been bought and paid for. And so you need to believe in Jesus. The other reason you may not find freedom, if you are a believer in Jesus, and don't let Satan ever make you doubt that you are, because he will do that. If you believe, then you're a Christian. No questions, no ifs, ands, or buts. You're there. If you believe in Jesus, and if you do believe and you find that, that you are lacking in freedom, it's because possibly you have retreated back into the prison that was built for you by the enemy from the wound, from the difficulty, from, from the bitterness, from the anger, from the alcohol, from the drugs, from, uh, uh, from the, the desire to control. And, and this prison has been built around you and you've retreated back into that. Even though the exit is clear, even though the doors are open, even though you're not chained, you've retreated back into the prison and you're sitting there wallowing in your unforgiveness, wallowing in it. And you don't know how to get out even though all the doors are open. The only way to get out and to, to experience that freedom is through Jesus. He'll walk you right through it. He'll walk you right out the door, but you've got to lean into Jesus and give it to him. And it's not going to be an immediate thing. I mean, maybe it is. It's never been for me. It's always been a process. It's always been an ongoing process. Sometimes it lasts years. Sometimes I'm still dealing with it now. Sometimes it's been a few days or weeks or months, but it's a process. And you've got to have Jesus, I, I need you. Jesus, I know that thing that's coming in my mind, that temptation, that, that, that unforgiveness, that uh, bitterness, that uh, uh, desire to control, that temptation. I know it's there, and, and uh, it's coming up right now. Strategy of the enemy, Jesus, I don't know anything that would come from that is, is, is not what you would have for me. I need your help, Jesus, right now. And you've got to allow him every single moment that pops up to guide you through to get you through, to experience the freedom. And then one day you're going to wake up down the road and you're going to realize, wow, that, that, that's not quite as intense as it used to be. It's not quite like it was. But it's not going to be tomorrow or the next day. It's going to be down the road. You just have to persevere. And don't go it alone ever. Bring somebody with you. Tell them what you're going through. James chapter 5, we're supposed to t confess to one another so that we can go down the road. And James says, confess to one another and pray for each other. It's not just supposed to be a dump session. You're supposed to confess. You're supposed to experience the release. But you're also supposed to pray for each other so you can have the strength to move on. It's a two-step process. Confess and pray. That's why we have small groups here in just a minute. We got small groups so we can go this world together because we are better together. We're not designed to be alone. That's why God made Eve after he made Adam. It's because he was bad when he was by himself. He needed somebody with him. You need somebody with you. Don't ever go it alone. Don't let the enemy convince you you can do it because you can't. Jesus himself, son of God, what's the first thing he do when he stepped out into the public ministry? He gathered people around him. If there's anybody who doesn't need a group, it's Jesus. But he got some guys. A bunch of messed up guys, but he got them. We got a bunch of small groups. They're messed up. I promise you. My small group's messed up because I'm in it. 
If you don't have one, come to them. Come to any one of them. You want to start a new one? You walk in, you can go down that green hall in the green room one. You come in there, you say, oh, this is a preacher small group. I need a different one than this. Walk out. We're not going to be offended, but we'll, you can start a new one with you and your people. Whoever it is. Whoever it is. Don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. Find the freedom that Jesus came to give you. And walk in it. Walk in it together with someone walking with you through that process. So wherever you find yourself today in needing freedom from something, if you're a follower of Jesus and you find that, that, that you're in bondage and you need freedom from some secret that you haven't told anybody, it's just back there in the back of your head, give it to Jesus today. Don't let your feet leave the green carpet until you've given it to Jesus. Maybe you need to walk across the room and grab somebody and say, I've got this unforgiveness in my heart. I've got this temptation going on. I've got this struggle right now. I've got this pain right now. I've got this uncertainty right now. And I need help. I need prayer. Nobody's going to think less of you because you ask for help because everybody needs help from time to time. You go and you ask and you ask for prayer. I'll be here at the front. Jared will be at the back. We would love to pray with you, walk alongside with you. But you, you come and you pray, even up here at the altar. Come up here and pray over you. Pray for somebody in your life who's struggling with this. Somebody who, who desperately needs freedom from something. Or maybe you today need Jesus. Because you don't know him yet. You've known about him. Easter, you know, okay, Jesus. I know we do Easter because of Jesus. I know we do Christmas, you know, because of Jesus and uh, we're at church because of Jesus, and I know this stuff about Jesus. You know about him, but you don't know him, like have a relationship with him. You don't talk to him. If you want to know Jesus, not just know about Jesus, that comes from belief. That comes from faith. That comes from trust. Like I said a minute ago, he's the son of God. He died so all of your sins would be forgiven. And he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. If you want that, salvation. I'd love to talk to you. I'll be right here, right here, drinking my water because my voice is going. And Jared will be at the back, and he'd love to talk to you, introduce you to Jesus. So whatever you are in your decision-making process today, whether you need to release something and find freedom from it, you need to pray for somebody who needs release, who needs freedom from something, or you need Jesus for the very first time today, we've all got decisions to make. We've all got prayers to pray. So I'm going to pray here in just a sec. And if you need to come, talk to me or Jared, pray with us. You need to come to the altar and pray, or just drop down on one of those green pews and pray. Turn to Jesus wherever you are in your journey today, and find freedom. Y'all pray with me. God, I thank you for freedom. Freedom that I so very often ignore in my closed vision of what I see in my life at times. But I thank you, God, that you offer that freedom to get out of these self-made prisons, to get out of these prisons made by other people and turn to you and find freedom from anxiety. Find freedom. From the persistent worry. from the anger that's always boiling right under the surface, from the discontentment, the judgmental attitude, from the lack of joy. And God, help us to, to, to turn to you. Offer up the things that we... Offer up the things that have us feeling trapped. And find eternal spiritual freedom. God, I pray that we would all turn to you. Maybe today for the very first time, somebody in the room, somebody watching online needs to turn to you. 
And God, I pray that you wouldn't let them ignore that, 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 little, that little word from your spirit. That's you. And if we already believe, God, help us to find freedom in you. Wherever we are, all of us in different spots, struggling with different things, but all of us still struggle to find absolute and complete freedom in you. And God, I pray also you bring up names of people in our lives who are who are trapped in prisons and need your freedom to release them. And we would pray and, and realize that you have put us in their lives to help bring them to that freedom. God, we thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for your eternal compassion and patience to walk us to freedom. God, we thank you. In your name I pray. Amen.